All right, we are going to get started. Um, good evening. I am Lisa Miller and I am the Assistant Superintendent of Student Services with Conejo Valley Unified School District. And it's an honor to be here tonight and to speak with all of you. Um, I do want to extend an appreciation to Gate DAC um, and Bajaya Eaton. Um, the, her thought uh, to have us offer this tonight, and I know she's with us, and I just want to make sure Gate DAC knows how much we appreciate uh, the effort to engage our community in parent information nights. Um, I also have a couple of my colleagues on the webinar with me. Uh, one is uh, Patricia Artigas. She is our Spanish speaking interpreter. If you would like a Spanish interpretation, there is a feature on your screen that allows you to join that. Um, there is a, a little symbol and it, I believe it reads interpretation next to it and you click on that. And inside there, um, you can click on English or Spanish um, and she will do the interpretation. So thank you, Patricia, for being with us. Um, Shauna Ashmore is also here and she is our Director of Student Support Services and Stephanie Caswell, who is our GATE teacher on special assignment. So tonight we're gonna talk about executive functioning and um, we will have an opportunity at the end for some questions uh, and to engage with you. I, I do wish we were in person. I tend to be interactive when I am doing presentations. Uh, so I'm certainly gonna miss that tonight, but hopefully we're gonna try to incorporate you and your voice and participation through the Q&A feature. Also tonight's presentation, it is being recorded. So we will have this uploaded and available. Um, I don't know if it'll be ready by tomorrow, but Monday probably at the latest. So let's talk about executive functioning. Well, first I wanna just say, you should really congratulate yourself because you needed to use executive functioning to join us tonight. Um, you made a plan to be here. You remember to log on um, or you set a reminder for yourself to join tonight. You put it in a calendar or somewhere and you likely had to clear your calendar in order to be here. So you took care of a few things and you did some advanced planning in order to free yourself to attend. And right now, actually, if you're listening to me and you're looking at the screen, um, that means you're controlling your attention. And um, if you're able to also simultaneously ignore your cell phone, you're applying another skill that's connected to executive functioning. So um, with that, I think we've done a great job already. So maybe we could uh, end the presentation here. Those are some of the big concepts of executive functioning. Um, so to go into more detail, executive functioning, it's really complex and it's actually a big umbrella term. Uh, so I don't want you to leave tonight thinking it's it's one thing, it's a one area of cognitive processing, because it isn't, it's actually several areas and it's the integration of those different areas of cognitive processing and cognitive functioning. It does begin at infancy, the development of these different skills, and it is influenced by nature and nurture. So as I mentioned, it's, it's a compilation of different cognitive processes. And these are the ones I'm going to cover tonight. The first one's attentional control. The next is cognitive flexibility, working memory, and information processing. Um, it's, it's how all of these actually work together that feeds into that overall term of executive functioning. I do wanna um, just highlight a few of the references that I lean on uh, for tonight's presentation. And I also wanna point out that this is um, you know, a summary of executive functioning. There's no way I could go into all the different areas and go into the depth that this topic actually deserves within an hour. So I want you to know it's a summary. Um, it's meant to be tangible tonight for you. I hope you take away some, some tips and increased understanding about executive functioning, but, but tonight is not um, a, a complete comprehensive review of it. So I wanted to start with just an example about executive functioning. 
So on the screen, you see different words of um, colors, but you also see different fonts and the font does not necessarily match what the word reads. So we're gonna try and practice a little bit of executive functioning right now. So to start, when you're looking at the screen, try to read the words um, from the top row to the bottom row, left to right, as fast as you can in reading the words and ignoring the font color. So you may have found that one to be um, somewhat easy, uh, reading the words and ignoring the font color um, is one of the entry level skills to do this example. But now we're gonna change it up a little bit. Now what I want you to do is actually to say the color of the font as opposed to reading the word that is written. And again, you're gonna do it left to right, um, top row to bottom row, and this time do it as fast as you can. So again, say the color of the font, not the word that's written. That one may have felt a little more difficult for you because you had to apply um, some additional cognitive skills uh, to retrieve the word of the color of the font. And then you had to ignore what was actually written. Um, so this next time I'm gonna um, ask us to look at this again, we're gonna practice some more executive functioning is, so I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to read and try to remember those first two rows of words. And then I'm gonna take the visual away and you're gonna try and restate the written words in order to yourself. So 10 seconds. Try to remember or state the words or write them down, the ones that were written. So again, that time we had to use a, another cognitive processing skill in order to remember, and then you lose the verbal, the visual prompt, and you have to rely on some short-term memory. And the last example to try to give a tangible example of you know, how complex executive functioning is, is on this one, I'm gonna have you read um, the font color again, so ignore the written word, but this time while you're doing that, turn the alarm on on your phone, have your kids start to ask you questions, turn the faucet on in your sink, um, maybe have somebody ring your doorbell, and now try to read the font color as fast as you can from left to right, top row to bottom row. Go ahead. So um, I'm hoping you didn't have to bring in all those distractions, but it was just meant to be an example of, of how um, your environment can play into um, your um, executive functioning skills. So moving on, I mentioned I was gonna go over four cognitive skill areas that feed into executive functioning. And the first one I'm gonna start with is attentional control. So this is our ability to focus, both our short-term focus and our long-term or sustained focus, along with our ability to concentrate. Additional control is also influenced by how much we can ignore competing stimuli. And a great example of that is our cell phones. Um, it is very frequent that ourselves or the people that we're around are frequently checking our cell phones. That is, uh, can be competing stimuli to one's ability to control their attention or their focus. And intentional control also means we can be deliberate in what we're paying attention to. So there might be several things going on and 
you might be able to tune out some of those things and select which element you want to be um, actually dedicating your attention to. And being able to do this actually leads to self-regulation because you're aware of um, where you're channeling your mental energy. So here's a, a cartoon that gets at this a little bit. And I want to talk briefly about so what are some real life examples of attentional control. And for those of you who can't read the cartoon, it's a, a child coming back home and says to the parent, my teacher said I don't pay enough attention in class. At least that's what I think she said. So let's take a minute or two to talk about some real examples of attentional control. And then I'm gonna go over some supporting strategies to enhance your attentional control. So this is a time for you. If you think you have a good example of a real life example of attentional control, put it in the, the question and Ms. Ashmore and Ms. Caswell will send it back out so everybody else can see. And um, Ms. Ashmore or Ms. Caswell, if one of you wants to speak to um, whether or not you have a real life example that might apply, that'd be great. I do. The ability to get lost in a book. Um, everything else fades away, whether the TV's on, the dogs are barking in the background, the kids are arguing in the next room. I am completely oblivious and I've seen it in my kids too. Um, and then I've in reverse, I've also seen it with them in a TV show. <laughs> and there's nothing that I can do to try and get their attention away from whatever it is they're hyper fixated on. So that is, thanks for sharing that example, because that's a great one about um, how much you can really, um, you know, have your attentional control be um, almost, like you said, hyper focused. Um, and there's also the opposite of that, where it's very hard to attend to anything for any long period of time. Um, those are both part of the continuum of attentional control. So I don't see any, I don't think in the Q and A feature, but that's all right. Um, we will keep going. But if anybody thinks of an example regarding attentional control, feel free to share that. Um, what I wanna talk about now is, um, what are some strategies or supports to address attentional control? One is mindfulness. Uh, this just helps all of us become much more aware of our own thoughts. And the more we're um, aware of our own thinking and our own thoughts, the more we can actually measure and evaluate what we're dedicating our attention to. This is a higher level of um, thinking uh, so um, it may not be completely possible for the little kids, um, but as kids mature, this is something that can help them increase or um, improve attention control is practicing mindfulness. Be aware of distractions. Some people can really tune those out while others can be really impaired by it. So be aware of what kind of person you are, what your skill set is with attentional control. And if you do need a quieter setting or a distraction free setting, then try to create that for yourself uh, because it can take up a lot of mental energy to ignore the competing stimuli. Uh, so being aware of what kind of attentional control you have does, uh, should um, also inform you on what level of distractions you can tolerate. Try to become aware of what's your attention length. Uh, for me, one thing I, I often find myself doing is when I read a book, at times I'll think, gosh, I have no idea what I just read. The last two pages, the last five pages, I was clearly not dedicating attentional control here, I was distracted. Uh, sometimes try to be reflective uh, when you're doing tasks about how long was it until I kind of lost focus on what I was, what I was doing? Um, because that can inform you of how long your attentional control is given the task. And then again, you may need to try to remove what the distractions are. Practice time tasks, these are you know, pretty simple ones to do. Um, and research does show that if we are informed that there's a limited amount of time, we then can tend to organize our mental energy to be more efficient. Uh, so if you practice time tasks, you can then um, become a little bit um, more facile in controlling that attention. And also just in general setting a time limit for yourself. Um, so that you aren't just having an unlimited 
um, you know, time to complete a task or to do something, uh, setting a time limit for yourself will help facilitate some of that attentional control. Dr. Miller, if I may jump in, we have an example and then actually a related question uh, in there. And the example was child zones out on school Zooms would rather surf the internet. Uh, and then the question uh, from another um, attendee was with homework needing to be done on screen and videos distractions just one click away, what are some strategies that can help focus on the schoolwork? Um, I have, I bet that question almost every parent <laughs> is probably um, challenged with. That is without question one of the most biggest, that's one of the biggest difficulties we have with kids being, our students being on screens right now is, is the amount of available distractions is so high and it's almost impossible to eliminate those. Um, you know, the, the only suggestion I have um, really about that is, is if you could set controls on what websites your students are able or your children are able to access. There are some parental controls that, um, you know, might feel inhibitory towards your child, but if that's what they need in order to maintain their focus and the attention to what you want them to, you may need to look into some of the parent parental controls and limit what websites they're able to access. Um, unfortunately though, there is just no, um, you know, complete solution on that one. But the example of being online and, and you're in a Zoom class, but then you're, you got another window open on your computer or whatever it is and you're surfing the web or you're playing a game. Um, it is, it's definitely a challenge. And I do think, you know, um, the level of which we can try to um, limit access to those would be great, but I know that that may not be entirely possible either. So I'm gonna move on to the next cognitive area. And this is cognitive flexibility. So cognitive flexibility speaks to um, the ease at which we can um, be fluid in uh, moving from one thought or thinking about one concept to another. Um, and it's, it's, like I said, it's really fluid. It doesn't take um, kind of these, um, these notifications in advance that something's about to change. Instead, you can do it with ease. Uh, one with high cognitive flexibility can think about multiple concepts simultaneously and not just rote concepts, but more complex concepts simultaneously. Also thinking beyond the obvious. Uh, so if the information isn't written in front of you or visually in front of you or an answer, um, you know, might be um, really obvious in front of you, but to think beyond that um, without having a visual or, or written stimuli to get you there is a, a good example of cognitive flexibility. The ability also to adapt to various environments uh, with ease, so going from a quiet setting to a, you know, a pretty loud setting or a really busy setting uh, to one where there's not um, a lot of, of distractions or activity. Also, um, you know, uh, somewhat the, the pressure level of the environment you're going into. Are you going into a work meeting or are you going into your office on your own? Those kinds of things. And having, um, you know, relative cognitive ease in going between different environments and, and really what's going on in the environment. Cognitive flexibility um, allows us to complete complex tasks and really moving beyond the remote. So when I say remote, there's a lot of skills, both academic in school and in our own lives as adults that are pretty remote. Brushing our teeth becomes really remote, you know, locking the door, things like that. What we're talking about here though are more complex tasks, um, such as you may need to repair an appliance in your house. Um, that's a more complex task. And, and um, you know, are you able to enter into that and perform that? Um, and solve that. Uh, so thinking about the more complex tasks we have every day, the more cognitively flexible you are, the more likely you are to be able to um, draw from various thoughts that can help you solve that complex task. Um, and also ultimately the more cognitive flexible one is, the more creative they are with solving problems. 
So on this one, cognitive flexibility, um, it also can assist in regulating behavior. For me, there's you know several examples here that or that I'll go over, but um, this cartoon I thought applied. They only taught me how to think outside of the box. I'm not trained for circles. That is a really good example of not having cognitive um, flexibility, that you're really locked in to kind of a routine or what's been told to you. A, a good real life example here for me personally is I'm really great at following a recipe. Um, you know, I can really execute on that pretty consistently, but if I was left without a recipe and asked to just, you know, pull a meal together based upon what I see in my refrigerator or in our cupboards, I would be at a loss. I am not creative that way. That for me requires thinking outside the box and that would be very difficult for me. Um, whereas I do know some people are so skilled at, oh, I had this, this and this, so I just ended up making this. And I think that's, that's a, that is definitely a sign of cognitive flexibility. I'm wondering if there are some other examples of cognitive flexibility. I can share a little inflexibility. Having lived in Kanea Valley my whole life, um, there are paths that I travel to get certain places that are very routine and remain the same every time I go to that place. And if there's road work or um, anything going on on my way to a destination that I am so accustomed to going to that requires that I shift my thinking into getting there another way. I always get stuck on frustration for a moment first before I have that flexibility to say, here's another route I need to take. Here's how I'm going to get there. That's a great example. Many people tend to like their routines and routines on some level, it reserves mental energy, which is good because then you can use the mental energy elsewhere, but it does not strengthen your cognitive flexibility when you overly rely on routines. Are there other examples? I was gonna share um, that as adults, and maybe this is just me, but as adults, um, we tend to experience cognitive flexibility in its purest form when we're trying to go to bed. All these thoughts running through my head. Did I turn off the lights? Are the doors locked? Did I check on the kids? What are we having for dinner tomorrow? Do I have an appointment? What does my calendar look like? All these things. So we're bouncing from thought to thought to thought. And it makes me think of that translation to our kids and bouncing from activity to activity in the house. And the next thing you know, your house is covered with toys and activities, you know, it's Legos, it's Barbies, it's all of these things. And they're expressing their cognitive ability and bouncing from one thing to the next in that way, I think. Yep, thank you both for sharing, I appreciate it. Are there any other examples being posted in the question feature? There's a, when the power was out for two days, having to cook everything on the gas stove and no instant pot or oven or microwave. That is an, ex that is such a good example. Yes. We really have to lean on this with unforeseen circumstances. Yep. Uh, musicians playing creatively beyond what is written. Uh, in Zoom calls, moving from class to class with different expectations in each one and, and adjusting to those. These are great examples. Thank you for sharing, audience. Those are wonderful. All right, let's talk about how do we support cognitive flexibility. Uh, one is try to break up your routines. Again, you know, we only have so much mental energy on a given day. So a routine allows us to save that mental energy, which is great in many ways. But breaking up routines does require uh, strengthening this skill. And this skill is essential uh, cognitive flexibility because it does allow you to navigate um, experiences that, that you may not be completely prepared for. Um, so break up routines to the extent that you can. Nothing significant, but just enough where you're having to think outside the box a little bit. Pursue new experiences. We all kind of get in a routine and a rut, 
um, you know, try new experiences, whether um, that's trying to play, you know, a different sport or play a different board game or, um, you know, uh, like Shauna said, going a different route between your home and your work or whatnot. Just try new things in a safe way, I want to say. Um, intentionally listen to and try and consider diverse perspectives. Um, this is a really good way to strengthen this skill uh, because our neural pathways become, you know, really fine tuned with, with the information that we take in and, and what we make sense of. So when you bring in new information, your, your neural pathways and your cognitive flexibility is required to flex at that time and really chew on it and try to um, make other connections in your mind. So try to extend and expand what the information is that you take in and consider diverse perspectives. Practice Sudoku, word scrambles, and for kids, even adults, building and playing with Legos. And when you're creating or building things with Legos, try to avoid using the directions uh, so that you're not following something that's been laid out for you. Also consider multiple answers and responses. Um, if you are often somebody that comes up with a quick answer, um, you know, which is a great skill, try to think though, is there a different way to answer that and think beyond that initial or gut re um, response or answer that comes to you quickly. And engage in self-reflection on this. All of these actually are strengthened and supported by engaging in some self-reflection, which I know is not necessarily easy for people. Sometimes looking in that mirror, um, you're not really happy with what you see, but it's so good for you to have some self-reflection because once you know where your skill set is, then you then you know where you want to grow and how to increase the capacity. So, like for me, I do often think about how connected am I and to root am I to routines? Am I and have I become too routinized? And do I need to break this up? Uh, for me, it can definitely be my gym and workout routine. Um, and that is something I've had to really, you know, guide myself through changing that up um, so it wasn't so routinized. And then how tolerant are you of unanticipated changes? And if you find yourself irritable with that or quickly frustrated with that, um, that might be an indication of where your cognitive flexibility skills are. And uh, again, you may want to try some of the things I listed above to strengthen that. All right, the next one we're gonna talk about is working memory. And this one is pretty substantial part of um, executive functioning. So working memory, and this one we really leaned on in that example I gave at the beginning with the words and different colors, is the ability to take in new information, whether that's a visual stimuli or a verbal or auditory stimuli. You cognitively hold on to this, this information that just came in. And while you're holding on to it, you're, you're making some meaning of it or you're keeping it in um, an immediate availability because now you're gonna use the information um, in some level of production. So you take in something, you hold on to it and you kind of manipulate it and then you have to give it back out. Um, so if you can imagine, you know, a day for a student in school, imagine all the incoming information for them. And if we're not applying working memory and we're not activating something where we're working on that incoming stimuli, it can be really difficult then to draw on it either in the short term or the long term to use that information. Um, also, while you're holding on to the information, you're really not wanting to lose track of it. That definitely assists with your working memory. And ultimately, your working memory contributes to what gets stored into your long-term memory um, because you're activating previously stored information and you're making a connection to the new information. And I'll go, this leans a little bit into the fourth category, which is information processing. But ultimately, like I said, working memory is you're taking in new information. I'm holding on to it um, because I'm going to use it relatively quickly in some action that I'm going to, to do. So 
Some examples, um, and here's a cartoon, which I'll let you read for yourself. I think that one is hopefully big enough font. And so that one is about, you know, remembering um, a locker combination. And I am sure some of you parents that are on here, you have kids that cannot seem to remember their locker combination. And so they have a key or, you know, obviously the office has the combination. Um, and um, what this cartoon highlights though is, is Charlie Brown found a way to make a connection to other information stored in long-term memory. Um, so on here, a great quick example of working memory is you want, somebody gives you their email address. You have nothing to write it down on. You didn't enter it in your phone. And you are really hoping that in about five minutes or less, you're going to get somewhere where you can write it down because you think if I have to wait longer than that, I'm totally going to forget. And you very well could. I probably would too. So when somebody gives you their email address and you try to hold on to it until you're able to solidify it in writing it down or something, same with people's phone numbers. Uh, you try to hold on to that information. Um, some of us are capable of holding on to it and, and keeping it correct and others of us get the numbers all jumbled by the time we're in a place where we can write it down or store it. Um, mental math, when a teacher or somebody, you know, says, you know, 18 times 12 is what, that requires, you know, you took in the information, the 18 and 12, and the word times, which is multiplication, you're leaning on previously some, some stored information in there about numbers and what times means, and now you're gonna give back an answer. Are there other examples of working memory people would like to share? There's a lot that feed into this particular cognitive skill. Uh, we have one who indicates their son can decode a few words in Morse code without ever writing anything down. That is great. What this one made me think of, Lisa, is um, often our children learn Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star at a young age, and they hear it, and they learn to sing it, and it becomes ingrained. And then if you think about the way we often learn the ABCs, we learn it with the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star um, to help it, to help store it immediately and then long term as well. Yeah, that's a good example. Another example um, is when you might be constructing something, repairing something, building something, and you're reading the directions, and the directions are on a piece of paper, and you go over to execute the directions that you just read, and you get halfway through the direction, and you think, oh my god, what did it say? Okay, I've got to go back, and I've got to reread the direction because I thought I remembered it, but I didn't remember it in its entirety, and you go back, and you read it, and then you go back to the task and you're able to get another step or two done and then you may have to go back. Um, so that's another example of some working memory. Any others entered that we want to share? There is one uh, passwords, especially as they're supposed to be more and more complex. Remembering those, um, child remembering phone number, addresses, birthdays, um, someone else said that they spell out people's names in their head to remember them. Um, and I was going to say something on a very simplistic scale is getting to the top of the stairs and forgetting what I came up to the top of the stairs for. Retracing my steps, going back down. Where was I last? Why did I go upstairs? I'm sure it was for something. Um, so that's a very minor scale of that one. Uh, the password one is so on point. Oh my gosh, how many of us struggle with remembering which password did I use for which website or which account? That is a really, really good one. So let's talk a little bit about, well, how can we support our working memory skills? Because this one really is essential uh, for academic growth, especially early academic growth when we're learning to read and write um, and 
and our math facts. So uh, one way to do to support working memory skills is is a term, you know, something that I've often used with students that I've, I've worked with is first this, then this. I'm trying to break down uh, multiple step directions um, and really, um, you know, just trying to simplify things so that extraneous information is not taking up my mental energy. So I, I really try to narrow um, what I'm, I'm requesting or advising or directing to be explicit. Um, so, you know, it might be um, first put your socks on, then put your shoes on. And I know that seems really simple, but, but when you think about giving directions or you're talking to somebody, how much extraneous, um, how many extraneous words are being said when really all you want them to hold on to are like two or three of those. Um, the next one for little kids, I, we all played that memory game where cards are face down, they need to turn one over and they turn a second one over and they're trying to find a match. That's a great game uh, to strengthen working memory. And those cards, you know, can have um, numbers, they can have letters, they can have words, they can have pictures. Um, there's a lot of different ways to play that one. When new information is coming into you verbally, try to restate it both verbatim as you heard it, but then also try to put it in your own words. Verbatim response doesn't require you to um, manipulate the information as it came in. Um, it's really just suspending it cognitively and you give it back. Whereas putting it in your own words requires some activation and manipulation of that information. And therefore it'll likely um, it's more likely to stay with you in longer term memory. Apply a mnemonic. Um, I used to have a lot of these um, when I was in college, um, taking different classes. Um, and when I would study, my, my friends and my classmates would have no idea what I was talking about, but it made total sense to me. Um, and that's the whole point of a mnemonic is that it makes sense to you. Um, Break down um, information into meaningful chunks. So again, you know, oftentimes a lot will come at us. The stimuli might be really complex. Try to break it down and chunk it out as opposed to um, trying to memorize it all in its entirety as it was delivered. Be aware of the environment. Again, you know, if distractions um, are really difficult for you, that's going to play into your ability to use your working memory. So try to minimize distractions um, or interferences. If working memory is a weakness for you um, and you're not alone, we one of the best things to come up with is, is a note-taking process. However, avoid making it worse by having a gazillion post-it notes or having random pieces of paper or on your, on your computer screen, you have a bunch of to-do lists all over. Try to really organize this because um, that will help with your working memory skills and it also just reserves some of that mental energy. So I'm gonna move on to the fourth of four cognitive areas we wanted to cover tonight. And this last one is titled information processing. And, and the best analogy is just think of a computer, um, you know, the makeup of a computer. So information processing requires attending. You're taking in information or stimuli. Um, then you encode that information that's coming in. You have to make sense of it. You're making a connection to something that's already stored. So, um, um, you know, we want to make those connections because the more connections that can be made, the likelier it is for it to get solidified and stored in long term memory. And storing in long term memory also, you know, you want it to be efficient storage um, so that you also have efficient retrieval. So a good example of this is um, if you use, well, Google Cloud or Google Drive is something that we use, but you can also just focus on your desktop. Um, by storing, so I've, I've, there's new information I, that came in. I encoded it. I read it. I needed to do something with it. I needed to make sense of it. And now I'm going to store it and I'm going to store it in a folder that I've labeled that makes sense to me 
for what the content of this information is. So that when I need to access this document at a later date, I can quickly think of what folder it's in because the way I encoded it made sense to me based upon what I already had stored. However, if I just leave it on my desktop and I don't put it in a folder or I don't organize it or I don't apply a prior knowledge to it, I'm gonna have really inefficient retrieval of that document when I need it. I'm gonna be required to scan my desktop or scan all my documents to find it. Um, information processing also allows for the synthesis and analysis, which really is just making those connections. Um, and by connections, I mean, cognitively, we are consumers. We take in a lot of information. Not all of it sticks, not all of it gets stored. Um, but what does stick and what you do store um, requires some synthesis and analysis of it for it to actually make it into long-term memory. Um, and it's making those connections of what previously was there and adding on to it. Um, and what really can influence this is the more opportunities, the words kids are exposed to, and the experiences kids or any of us have, um, the more likely we are to extend out those um, opportunities to make connections because I now have more opportunities, experiences or words um, or visuals that I can look to to help me remember and make sense of new information coming in. So ultimately the more opportunities one has, the more expansive their long-term storage is and therefore the more likely new information comes in um, will likely have a connection to something that's already been stored. So it's, it's complex. This is a great visual of it. So much information comes in and can you organize it in a way cognitively, cognitively or neurologically so that you have efficient retrieval of it? Um, how many times have you sat at your computer and you're thinking, oh my God, where did I save that file? Where did I save that document? Um, and so when you think about information processing, that's a good example of, did I save it in a way that made sense to me? And was it um, efficient in what made sense to me so that I can efficiently retrieve it? So let's talk about some real life examples of information processing. And this one's a lot more complex because this has multiple um, cognitive skills that feed into information processing. There's not just one thing. So one of the examples that was entered was a high school student learning a new language and processing the vocabulary for the language in order to then develop the whole language skill. That is a really good example. And I would also apply that to imagine being an English learner and you are, your home language is something other than English, but you are in English only instruction. It is really hard then to, when you're hearing these English only words come in, it's very hard to make the connection of what you have stored because you don't know yet know either the Spanish or Cantonese or Mandarin word that connects to it. And so now that's interfering with e um, efficient storage and potentially efficient retrieval. So that second language one is a great example. There's another example, reading the book Fahrenheit 451 understanding it, and then being able to write an essay about it thereafter. Yep, that's another good one. Um, you know, that to me also highlights how information processing is over time. This is not something that's stagnant. Your information processing is constantly happening and it happens over time. Labeling and archiving emails as they come in instead of letting thousands of emails <laughs> build up in the inbox. That definitely helps. All right, let's talk briefly about how we can support our information processing skills. Okay, we, we have to allow for brain breaks. Your brain and 
I can only take in and work efficiently for so long. Um, so if you're constantly on the go or there's constant activities going on, um, that can have a detrimental effect to allowing your brain time to synthesize, analyze, and organize all the information that's come in. So it's actually really healthy to give a brain break, um, which, you know, might be um, going for a walk. For some, it might be reading. Um, you know, others, it might be watching TV. Others, it's exercising. Others, it's cooking. Just as long as that activity or whatever you're doing is not meant to add a lot more new information that requires more connections to be made, more storage to be made, on and on. So finding ways to take brain breaks is actually really healthy. Um, expand where one's information and stimuli derives from. This kind of goes back uh, to the working memory a little bit of, um, is it only coming in one way? Am I really, is the stimulus that I get, is it from one source? Is it delivered in one modality? Or am I expanding that? Um, the more expansive it is, again, the more opportunity you have to have various um, stored files that you can then make connections to when new stimuli comes in. We talked about this one, chunk things, break complex information or stimuli down into small parts so that you can assist with um, the effective storage. If, if there's a, a large thing like the book, you know, um, Fahrenheit 451, if that, you know, that is, that's a complex book, but if you're able to chunk it or identify themes or different things like that, you then are more likely to make a connection to something that's in your stored memory based upon the theme that you identified. Um, and there's, you know, you could identify sub themes from that. So breaking things down. Summarizing in your own words is such a critical skill um, as opposed to just rote regurgitation. Or you can summarize things by drawing a picture. What, how did you make sense of that stimuli that came in? It doesn't always have to be verbal. Um, or written, you can draw a picture or you can do movements, some way that's allowing yourself to encode the information. And practice making connections. Um, how quick are you with naming synonym, synonyms of words or antonyms or even genres and themes? So those are four areas of cognitive skills that feed into executive functioning. I would be remiss if I didn't identify some additional considerations that really influence one's um, overall executive functioning um, profile. There is absolutely an emotional overlay. Our feelings and our mental health totally influence um, the proficiency of the skills that we just went over. So if you're anxious, if there's stress, if there's fear, if you're low on sleep, um, those things will interfere, again, with the proficiency of these ex um, executive functioning. I thought a great example of, of kind of executive functioning and just, you know, the, how influential um, mood and feelings are to your, your cognition is that Pixar movie Inside Out. Um, so if you're looking for a movie that helps you conceptualize executive functioning and how um, feelings and moods can influence it, that's a great that's a great movie. Um, your environment and setting also influence the performance of your executive functioning skills. Um, and what I mean by this is for students in particular, are you in a home where you have a place uh, to study uh, that's quiet or free from distractions? Do you have heat? Um, you know, do you have some comforts in, in your home? Um, just the overall setting can really influence this. Also, um, you know, if life is stressful and you are preoccupied with just meeting some basic life needs, you know, am, where am I gonna get my meal today or my food today? Or am I going to have shelter? Or am I going to have, for some of our families right now, it's am I gonna have internet? Because school is so, you know, reliant on internet. Um, you know, it, it, some of those things absolutely will interfere in Trump uh, one's ability for executive functioning. And overall, 
these do not work in isolation. Um, you know, they all require the integration of one another for executive functioning. And it's funny, you know, across all of these, some of us have strengths in some of the ones I mentioned tonight, and others, we have weaknesses in some of the areas. It's rare that you're, you're have high strength in all of them. Um, if you do, that's fantastic. Um, but it's quite common to have a strengths and weakness profile within the ones we just mentioned. So in, you know, being mindful of time, um, well, and executive functioning develops over time. I don't want you to think at age 16, we were at our peak in these skills. Uh, that's not true. Uh, you know, it, it continues to develop. I don't want to spend time on this. I was just going to go back over, can you see now the different cognitive skills we went over and how they applied to this activity? But I'll let go of that. Um, so you should be really proud of yourself for being here with us tonight because you had to use a lot of, of executive functioning to be with us. Um, and we'll, we have the last five minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in there. And thank you so much for being here and giving up an hour of your evening. I know everybody is so busy um, and have a lot going on, but it means a lot to us that you would spend an hour with us. You said there's a couple questions that remain. Uh, the first one is, my son has three screens open when playing video games. Is this actually useful for his brain? You know, without knowing more specifics about what is on each screen and what what's the purpose of, of the game, um, it, it would be hard for me to answer that. It, it really depends on what what skill you're hoping your child is developing by, by playing that game. I don't know if that is helpful or hurtful. I apologize, I can't be more specific, but there's just too many variables that I don't know. Uh, there's another one. Our daughter is excellent at considering multiple options. It is choosing one that's the struggle. How long do we let her consider the options before getting down to work? I'm so glad somebody asked that because each of these skills, it's almost like you can have such a high skill level in it that it becomes impair, it impairs you, or you can have a lower skill of it. And that can also be somewhat impairing. Um, if for those that can be really, you know, that can have a difficult time being decisive um, because you're weighing a lot of options, setting a time limit on that can be a healthy way to develop a skill to be more decisive. The longer some people have to contemplate, the worse it is. Um, you know, so cutting that off, the length of time of contemplation, because uh, that's just now you're losing mental energy. Um, so setting a time limit for the decision needing to be made can reserve that mental energy and also help the students start to become um, more facile in knowing when and how to make decisions in um, you know, in a more ef um, efficient manner. Next one, I've heard that executive functioning becomes difficult in the teen years. Why is this and does it improve or when does it improve? What doesn't become difficult in the teen years? Um, you know, we, you, now you have the hormones um, overlay on this, which tends to have an increase in some of the emotional development and the mental health development. Um, that is part of it. Um, but it's also, you know, life just becomes more complex. And the more complex life becomes, the more, I don't want to use the word frayed because that sounds negative, but the more, you know, our attention is being drawn in different directions and whatnot. So it's, it's, it's not all negative um, during that period that the skills will continue to develop. It might seem like impairment at the time, but it isn't. It's just because life has become more complex and their brain is trying to catch up with that complexity. Okay, uh, is there a best strategy for when you're paralyzed because there's so much to do? Um, you know, that's, that is something I have supported students and families with 
Um, you know, one thing I didn't mention at the beginning was I am a licensed educational psychologist and have actually worked with quite a few families and students over the over the years on on it, things like that. Um, when you're feeling overwhelmed to the point where you are you become almost paralyzed, you just can't even try to tackle one thing because it's like a domino, everything will fall. Um, my encouragement to you is to um, work through that. Um, the longer we stay paralyzed, the harder it becomes to get out of it. Um, so like I said, my encouragement to you is to work through it. And by working through it, I mean, finding one small element of the huge to-do list to accomplish and allow yourself to feel proud and accomplished for doing one small element of it. Um, that skill tends to snowball. So once you're able to tackle one, and it doesn't need to be the biggest one or the one that takes the most time, it really actually shouldn't. If you can find one, that you can tackle or address, um, and again, it can be a really small one, you will feel a sense of accomplishment and you can now pick up the next one. Um, unfortunately though, the longer we stay in a paralyzed state or the longer we avoid tackling these lists and whatnot, um, the more we kind of decompose. Um, and so then you're, you're almost solidifying your skill set to avoid and not engage. Uh, so trying to get out of that as soon as you can in the small steps um, is, is what I would recommend. Uh, so we'll go one more. Uh, for a child whose cognitive skills may be lower, is there a better way or a best way to help them um, access executive functioning skills? Can you, I'm sorry, can you say that again? For a child who's uh, lower on a cognitive scale overall, what is the best way uh, to help them access executive functioning skills? Um, so one thing, you know, there's a few thoughts that I have. Um, I talked tonight quite a bit actually about mental energy. Um, you know, we all have different levels of mental energy and for individuals that might have a cognitive impairment, um, one of the things that we can do as the adults is to try to minimize um, how our child might be using their mental energy unnecessarily uh, because we wanna reserve that for the explicit skill development that we're looking to target and have them strengthen. And, by, and what I mean by this is really pay attention to the environment that the student is in. Is there extraneous stimuli? Is there extraneous distractions? First and foremost, try to minimize and eliminate as much of that as you can, um, because we want to support the child in maximizing the mental energy. Then um, when looking or thinking about executive functioning, uh, tonight I went over you know, several strategies or activities that can really get to the different cognitive areas. So it's not just addressing executive functioning, we need to break that down. We need to think about, are we wanting to work on working memory right now? And for a child, working memory might be that memory game that I mentioned. Um, it might be, um, you know, where they turn a card over and they're looking for the match. Um, you might need to start with just five cards, six cards to begin so that there's only three pairs, but then you expand out and you work up to 10 pairs or you change what those pairs are. Um, you're also um, wanting the child to state back to you what they understood um, that you said to them or state back to you or try and summarize something that they read, um, you know, or have them draw um, what they understood that you said to them or that they read. Um, so I encourage you to actually first try to, one, think about the environment, and then two, think about these, um, these um, cognitive areas of skills a little bit in isolation, and then use some of the strategies we went over tonight to practice that skill individually. Um, trying to address executive functioning overall, it'll be a tailspin. Um, instead, it's really looking at these in, in the individual skill area.
I think we're, we're just about cut up. You know, I see the question about coloring. Um, you know, doing something that is calming or helps you feel centered or grounded is a great way to reserve mental energy and free that up to other things that you're needing to pay attention to or to make meaning from. Um, so it does not interfere with executive functioning if it's a calming or centering activity. But if it's something that's challenging or kind of elevates um, you know, anxiety or adrenaline, it may not be um, serving the right purpose. All right, it's um, just after seven. Um, I hope people that are on here, you found this helpful or informative. Um, again, this is just a summary of executive functioning. If you go to Google and you look it up, you're gonna think, she didn't even talk about this. Um, I couldn't possibly cover everything, but I hope this was a, a good summary. Um, and again, thank you to GateDAC for thinking of this and um, hope everybody is well and that you're healthy and staying safe. Um, and, and we appreciate your time. Take care.